part one. Sometimes I wake up and stare at the ceiling. Soft morning light pours through the blinds, and in the distance I can hear the sound of a mower, or perhaps a neighbor's dryer. And for these blessed moments of tranquility, I am lulled into a sense of peace. I'll wake up next to my wife, we'll make breakfast, drop off our daughter at daycare, and I'll walk to work. Or perhaps it's the weekend and we can stay in bed for a few minutes longer before the telltale sound of stomping two-year-old feet clamber into the room to awaken us. But my memory slowly creeps up into my consciousness, and the feeling vanishes, replaced by a resounding sense of loss and fear. I sometimes instinctively look to my right. The bed is empty. I am alone. The memories start to flood into my mind, and I remember how I got here. Oh, God. I remember. This is not a series of events that sounds likely or probable. I don't care what you think. Of the scant few people I've told or try to tell this story to, only one has ever truly believed me. The rest look at me with a form of pity or bemusement in their eyes. Then I close my mouth or laugh it off like a joke. I don't see many people anymore. My name is Michael Anthers. I live in Los Angeles, where I was born and raised. My high school years, I always assumed I would move away from L.A. and never come back. So intense was my desire to leave the city. My house overlooked the downtown skyline, and every night I looked out at the city lights with a feeling of dread. I wanted nothing more than to leave the smog-ridden, phony, traffic-filled, and in my view, pointless city. After high school, I left and got my undergrad and master's in design in San Francisco, eventually picking up jobs and internships in New York City, where I assumed I would live the rest of my life. I landed at a large-sized product design firm, which allowed me for less creative freedom, but the pay was good, and I could maintain a certain amount of anonymity. A family tragedy, however, altered my life course. My father suffered a massive heart attack and died suddenly. Being his only child, it was up to me to take care of his affairs. My mother had died five years before to cancer, and no one remained to settle his affairs. My father, Peter, owned a handful of houses in the Hollywood area that he had inherited from his mother, and spent the latter part of his life managing these properties and their tenants. My grandmother had bought the houses over a long span of time, ranging from about 1941 to the late 1980s. She had come to California from Louisiana in the 1920s with practically nothing, and through a series of jobs and smart financial planning had obtained the houses and up-and-coming neighborhoods for mere pennies compared to their value today. She was quite clever. Upon her death, the management and caretaking responsibilities had fallen on my father and partially on me. You see, my father had been deaf for most of his life after being wounded in the army, and I sometimes acted as his ears when meeting with tenants or contractors over the years. When I moved away or wasn't available, and after my mother had died, he had his friends help him or he carried around yellow flashcards to write notes on. To clarify, he could speak well and read lips, but he had a certain amount of embarrassment about how he thought his voice sounded and used the cards to do most of his business. My mother and I told him that he was just fine without them, but he employed the flashcard method for years. Even after the advent of smartphones and portable computers, a Luddite to his core, Having no history of heart disease and living a healthy lifestyle, his death had come as a shock to me. 
a sudden massive heart attack. I remember flying over Los Angeles on the tail end of my journey on my way from New York and experiencing that same feeling of dread from my childhood. The Santa Ana winds must have blown through because the city was in rare form and had gleamed brightly that night, beckoning, not obfuscated by its usual smog. Securing my father's affairs, arranging his funeral, and transferring his holdings into my name was an arduous and painful task. Like myself, my father was an only child. Further, he had no dealings with his mother's family for over 30 years due to long-standing disagreements. His father's family all lived in Germany, and my dad had spoken to them maybe once in his entire lifetime. His few friends and old army buddies, while supportive, were of an ilk that descended into heavier drugs and alcohol after the war. Some of them had survived the painful years after returning from the dense terror of jungle warfare. Others hadn't been so lucky. My father was one of the luckier few that managed to pull his life together, and though he kept in touch, many of his friends were so far gone by the time of came of age, most of them had disappeared off the radar completely. I stayed in my old room, unable to use the bed my parents had once slept in. Though much of it had changed, a few of my cure posters still lay in place on the walls, and I'm sure I could have found an old weed pipe if I looked hard enough. The funeral was short. I buried him next to my mother in a small cemetery in Beverly Hills, near where he grew up. A few of his friends I knew showed up, a couple of my old high school buddies and a few tenants also showed up, past and present. He had been a really decent and kind landlord. I also saw a couple people I didn't know who stood a ways away and did not greet me. I don't remember what they looked like, but I do remember the far-off, dour looks they had on their faces. When I asked them how they knew my father, they would reply that they were associates. Having too much to deal with at the time, I solemnly nodded and promptly forgot them. I remember a far-off flock of crows circling above our heads and peeling off in a westerly direction as we stood around the fresh grave, listening to the minister's words. I found it odd. My father was never a religious man at all, but had insisted that the family be buried in the same church and graveyard as his mother. Shortly after, I began the process of dealing with the inheritance and transfer of the properties. I took no pleasure in obtaining these houses. I yearned to go back to New York and resume my work at the design firm, but the task of dealing with his belongings and the extraneous mountain of paperwork was sucking all my time away from any thoughts of that. When it looked as if I had a proper management company in place and was all squared away to leave a new roadblock appeared in my path. I discovered that one of his tenants, a woman by the name of Christine Tharler, had not been paying rent. When I checked into the matter further, I found that, though he had recorded her rent as received, she had not paid a dime in over five years. Christine had come to the funeral and stood with the people that I didn't know, even seemed to shed tears. He had never mentioned anything about this to me, and she owed him thousands of dollars by the look of things. This upset me to no end. Money had been tight for him close to his death, and despite my plea for him to sell one of the houses and live comfortably, he remained obstinate that we hold them all. I called Christine one dreary morning and inquired about the years of missing payment. She said that my father and her had entered an agreement, and that she told him she would pay him back some day. She lived in a charming bungalow house in the flats of Hollywood, just below sunset before Fountain. The neighborhood was shady and surprisingly quiet, with large copa de oras and jacarandas dotting the sidewalks, a haven in the middle of an otherwise bustling city. The bungalow house had been built sometime in the early 1920s and included a back house that was once a stable. We called it simply The Barn. Over the years, we had rented the barn to quite a few tenants. 
One tenant would take the house in front, while the other in back had a small but cozy two-storied structure. A low ceiling hung on the first floor, and a kitchenette stood on the left as you walked in. A precarious group of stairs met you in the back to take you up to a second floor that usually served as a bedroom, depending on who was living there. The city had shut down the rental of the barn about seven years prior, citing various building code violations, and it had stood empty, filled with the storage of whoever rented the front house or sometimes served as an office or a studio space. Apparently at one point it had housed my dad's first cousin Kevin, another veteran, who also served as our handyman, but eventually alcohol and drugs took their toll on him, and he became more of a nuisance than a help. We finally, painfully, had to evict him after his third violent incident involving the police when he had beaten his girlfriend almost to death. He had died not two months later by his own hand. When I arrived at the bungalow house to speak with Christine Tharler, the first thing I noticed was that there was another mailbox attached to the front gate, indicating an address in the back. The barn. I knew it once. She had been renting the barn without my dad's permission, pocketing the money herself and still not paying my father the rent he was due. I was infuriated and had seen all that I needed to see. Christine had stood at the door with a look of contempt in her eyes, as if she was loath to give up her free rental. I could see that she had spun some yarn for my father, probably telling him a sob story. He was such a big-hearted softy to a fault. Maybe her stories were even true, though I doubted it. Christine must have been close to sixty, with short, spiked brown hair, wide hips, and pale blue eyes. She was also an animal hoarder, and the interior of the bungalow house was basically ruined from years of cat urine and lack of repair. How could my father have let this house get so far into disrepair? How could he have let this woman use him to such a degree? It was not like him to suffer these kinds of indignities, especially regarding the rental properties. He always took care of the houses to the best of his ability and didn't spare a dime when it came to repairs. I was baffled. I soon had to take her to court to evict her, a process that was going to take weeks or perhaps months. It was at this point that I realized I was going to have to make a lifestyle change and either move my affairs to L.A. or try to manage all of this business from New York. Luckily, the firm I worked for had a Los Angeles branch in West Hollywood. So I picked up my life and moved back to the city I had so desperately tried to escape in my youth. It seemed the only option to make any real sense. I remember going back to New York briefly to settle my affairs and move the stuff out of my apartment. I felt a profound sense of loss, sitting in my favorite bar in Greenwich Village. I stared at the beer sloshing at the bottom of my glass, misty-eyed, and said goodbye to my friends and co-workers. I drove across the country almost straight through, hardly stopping and making excellent time, taking the 40-hour drive in just a few days. It was around this time of great transition and upheaval in my life that I met my future wife, Sarah. She was a friend of a co-worker's and we met at my firm's getting-to-know-you gathering at a place on Melrose, basically an excuse to drink. She was a professional musician and played bass as a session player around town. We hit it off, fell in love, and were married about 18 months later. We had our child, Fiona, less than a year after that. In the interim, I remodeled the charming bungalow house, ripped out the walls and floors, and created a wonderful rental, in my view. Sarah had come to love the house, too, and on a whim, we decided to move into it. It felt right. I can't explain it any more than that. Really, it felt like the right thing to do. Though we were giving up my father's house with a view of the city, we sensed that the spacious backyard and proximity to my job would more than make up for the downgrade. Why, I could walk to my office from the house in just 15 short minutes. Besides, 
We could rent my father's old place for a great price and live happily ever after in our charming bungalow house. The barn became a storage area and music studio for my wife, though due to certain complications and injuries from the birth of our daughter, she had to greatly reduce the amount of time she spent working. It was a few months after we moved into the house that the first incident occurred. Fiona had just turned two, and the now annual fall superfires were just beginning to die down. A haze of smoke covered the city, and we had just finished putting away our last few moving boxes. It began in the dead of night. I jolted awake from a deep slumber, when I noticed an odd sight. Our bedroom window faced the backyard, and through the shade I could see that a light was on in the barn's upper window. I had been in there that day, so perhaps I had left it on, I thought, though I was usually pretty studious about details like that. I gazed over to the clock. 3.10 a.m. I could tell that sleep was not going to be coming upon me anytime soon. I could see the baby monitor over my wife's sleeping shoulders. Fiona was tossing in her sleep, rolling one way and the other. Praying I didn't wake her, I got out of bed and began to make my way to the back door. I was about to reach for the door handle when I suddenly stopped dead in my tracks. A sudden fear gripped my body and I tensed up, not wanting to touch the knob or take a step further. I knew the feeling was irrational. I had been in the barn many, many times, but as much as I wanted to turn the knob, I just couldn't get my hand to listen to my brain. I stepped back from the door and listened. Silence. Taking a deep breath and laughing to myself slightly, I reached for the knob and turned it in one quick motion, stepping into the chilly night air. I could smell the smoke of the distant fires and hear the trees rustling in the Santa Ana winds, the same winds that made it a nightmare for firefighters in Southern California. The automatic light flicked on in the backyard, sensing my presence, which startled me. Laughing to myself, I started towards the barn just twenty feet away. A grass patch sat between the back door and the barn dotted with small gray stepping stones. They had been there for at least forty years. When I reached the first stone, I stopped suddenly. The light was off. I gazed into the two small windows of the upper floor of the barn. Fearing a squatter, or worse, the previous illegal tenant, I went to the door and tried the knob. It was locked. I had replaced all the locks, and there was no way to open the windows from the outside unless you broke them. Besides, the backyard was protected by a large wooden fence over eight feet tall, and the gate doors were locked with fresh padlocks. Making my way to the fence, I checked the locks, all bolted tight. I checked for any sign of forced entry whatsoever, shining my cell phone light on the windows, the grass, the flower patches surrounding the barn. Nothing. I made my way back to the house, but suddenly turned to look at the barn. The light was still off upstairs, but I just had to make sure. Gritting my teeth, I went to the barn door and unlocked it. The door slowly creaked open, and I stared into the darkness. Once again stealing myself, I reached in and turned on the lights. Tasteful sconce lighting illuminated the first floor. A low, squat ceiling hung over a new carpet complete with large beams that had once indicated partitions, probably where horses stayed, I imagined. The room held a couple of amplifiers, bass guitars, as well as an upright bass, and a recording rig my wife had gotten installed before we even moved into the house. I listened intently and gave a timid, Hello? I heard nothing. Perhaps I had imagined that the light was on. I turned to leave when a tiny creak in the ceiling above me rocketed my pulse and sped up my breathing. I strained to listen. It had sounded like a footstep. Or maybe it was just the structure settling. Listen, if there's anyone there, 
I'm calling the police. Come down now, and I'll let you go, no questions asked. Silence. My heart beating irrationally fast, I made my way to the precarious and narrow stairs in the back of the room. I gazed up to the second floor. It was dark. I turned on my cell phone flashlight and stomped up the steps, heart beating furiously. When I reached the top step, I quickly flipped on the light and braced myself. A small bed lay in the corner of the room, complete with a Disney's Moana blanket. A few of our sundry household items lay in neat piles in the corners of the room on the wooded floor. The ceiling felt low and claustrophobic, and no coat of fresh white paint could ever cover the fact that this structure was made in a different era. There was no one there. The overhead light cast a pallid glow on the light wood floors. The thin coat of dust that had gathered on the bed and items was not even disturbed. Maybe I had just imagined that the light was on, or perhaps there had been a slight surge in electricity, as if I knew anything about that. Either way, it was nothing. I tromped back down the narrow stairs, flicking off the lights and closing the barn doors behind me. Taking one last look behind, I gazed at the dark windows and laughed a little to myself, freaking out over a light. I returned to bed and closed my eyes to sleep. Honey? My wife's voice roused me from a slow descent into slumber. You left the light on in the barn. My eyes blinked open, and through the Venetian blinds, I could see the upstairs light on. Funny, I don't remember you or I going in there today, she muttered sleepily. I turned and planted a kiss on her back. It's okay. Let's just leave it for now. I'll get it tomorrow. I didn't sleep much that night, and what sleep I did get was filled with vivid dreams, maybe nightmares, though I didn't remember them when I awoke. I often don't remember my dreams. A week later, I viewed the incident with a kind of contempt. I had been foolish to be afraid of some light bulb and a ceiling fan. I thought of the little filament in the bulb surrounded by argon gas, screwed into a light socket, connected to a copper wire, snaking through the ceiling and into the switch. There were so many explanations for what could have possibly caused the light to go on. Life was marching on smoothly. Fiona was about to start ABC school, which is basically glorified daycare, so that Sarah could return to work. I was getting along swimmingly in the office, and... We had new tenants in my dad's old place that were working out quite well. We were beginning to think of trying for a second child. Or getting a cat. Or both. Who knew? Not bad, I had said to myself as I drifted off one night. I awoke with a start from a deep slumber. I gazed at my phone. 3.10 a.m. Before I turned my head to look... I knew what I would see. The light in the barn was on again. My body tensed up and my breathing shallowed. I gripped my hands into fists, feeling my heart rate rise. I should just leave it, I thought, though I knew I wouldn't. Ridiculous, I muttered as I forced myself to sit up and slip a robe on. I made my way to the window and gazed through the blinds at the upstairs barn window. I looked at it for a count of five and was about to turn away when something caught my eye. A quick shadow or movement covered the window for a fraction of a second, as if something had fallen from the ceiling and blocked the light. It happened so quickly that I could have just imagined it. But the more I thought about it, the more I knew I had seen something. Curiosity peaked, I made my way to the back door and went for the knob. I knew it was stupid. If anything, I should have just called the police and let them check it out. It could have been a thief or some kind of bug flying in front of the light. I didn't know. But I was determined to prove to myself that I was not afraid of half-imagined shadows and light switches. It is the eye of childhood that fears a painted devil, I thought to myself. Shakespeare's Macbeth had been one of my favorite pieces of literature in college. 
I pushed the door open. The air was thick. It seemed to pull at my body as I stepped closer to the barn. It was then that I stopped frozen in my tracks. I heard voices. I strained to listen, but the voices were very distant, as if they were far away upwind. It seemed to be two people talking, laughing, maybe three. I couldn't tell. I would have usually dismissed the sound of voices. We were in the middle of Hollywood, after all. Quieter neighborhood, but Hollywood nonetheless. Perhaps it was just the neighbors up late, or two people walking home after visiting the bar. But something about the way these voices sounded was odd. It was as if the subjects conversing were not in a single defined location, but everywhere at once. Almost out of earshot, but not quite. Also, their voices echoed in a troubling way, as if they were in a large cavern and not in the open air. I suddenly had the distinct impression that I was not alone. I gulped and started forward again. A series of intense, tiny pinprick sensations suddenly bloomed on my right leg and began to work their way up my body. I felt like my nerve endings were firing electricity out of them, and the hair on my body stood on end. Ah, I had thought sardonically. So this is what that icy chill feels like they talk about in the movies. As if in response to that thought, another wave of current opened up on the back of my neck, this one even stronger, and worked its way across my body felt as if I had been thrown into a bath of cold electricity. That's the only way I can describe it. This had all taken place in a matter of moments, and at that point I knew it was probably time to turn around and go inside. I briskly walked back towards the house and grasped the doorknob. I turned one last time to glance at the window, and my stomach dropped. I saw a figure silhouetted in the window of the barn. It looked to be a male of average height with short cropped hair. I couldn't quite tell. The light behind the figure seemed to intensify to create a more distinct shadow. That was frightening all on its own, but the thing that truly terrified me was that the figure hung completely upside down. Its arms stretched down towards the floor and its head was cocked to one side. It slightly swayed as if it hung by a rope, and from what I could make of its outline, it looked like it was wearing some sort of bulky nightshirt. It seemed to spasm as it swayed, jerking its head up in small motions. I didn't look for too long. Every moment I spent gazing at the grotesque figure was another second the image would be emblazoned on my mind. Frantically, I opened the door and slammed it behind me, skidding into our kitchen. I pulled out my phone with a shaking hand and dialed the police. I had never felt fear like that in my life, and I was certain there was no possible way I could ever be more terrified. I was wrong. The police came that night and searched the barn. When I led them up to the door, the lights were off upstairs. Of course, I mused to myself. As I let them in, I knew what they were going to find. Nothing. Sure enough, the barn lay still. No upside-down figure hung from the ceiling, and in fact, nothing was disturbed at all. My wife held my hand at our front door while we watched the police cruiser pull away. Luckily, Fiona had slept through the entire ordeal. Sarah turned and matched my gaze with a look of concern. Are you okay? she asked. Yes, I replied. I know it sounds nuts, but I know what I saw. I took a deep breath. Look, if you're having doubts about my sanity, I want to tell you that it was real, as real as I see you here. And okay, maybe it was some kind of temporary insanity or dust or something, and I overreacted, but, you know, better safe than... She gently shushed me. No. It's not that, she said. Her eyes widened and suddenly filled with tears. She leaned forward, and in a low, frightened voice, she whispered, 
I saw it too. I was watching you through the bedroom window. I saw it too. The next few days were filled with anxiety. We were not sure what we had seen, and as we discussed it, we weren't even sure it happened at all. Maybe an animal or moth had come across the light and created a horrifying shadow in the window. And besides, even if it was something we couldn't explain, what could we even do about it? Maybe we could call one of those ghost hunter shows, or maybe visit a psychic on Santa Monica Boulevard to take our money, tell us its spirits, and for a small series of installments they would be able to get rid of them for us. My wife had mused one night over wine after we put Fiona to bed. We laughed. It's the last memory I have of Sarah and I laughing together. Most of my nights were filled with vivid, intense dreams that I forgot as soon as I awoke. I slept lightly and frequently woke up, fearing to see the light on in the barn. I had flipped the breaker off but I still feared that somehow it would turn on. Ridiculous, I had thought. I still managed to avoid going into the place for the next few days, always finding an excuse not to go in there. About five days later, the air in and around the house had gotten thick, as if it was made of a fog we couldn't see. It was December in Los Angeles, which meant that the weather was fluctuating between 65 and 75 degrees and had varying degrees of clouds, sometimes creating an overcast. There were some perks to moving back to L.A. It had been a sunny weekend morning. Fiona and I played in the backyard. Sarah sat on a lawn chair, coffee in hand, scrolling through her phone as Fiona and I chased each other around the yard. Now, next to our house is a small, grassy alleyway that connects the front of the house to the backyard. On one side, the neighbor's ivy-colored fence, on the other, our house. It looks like a long, skinny lawn bowling alley, and Fiona delighted in running back and forth along the grass, reaching the gate that covers the side of the house, then fleeing back to the yard. I chased Fiona, colored chalk covering her hands and face, screaming with delight to the side of the house, and she rounded the corner into the alley. She could not have been more than six feet ahead of me. I turned the corner as well, and she was suddenly not there. I could only see the alley stretching toward the gate. Overhead, a crow circled round, singing its throaty song. Perplexed, I laughed a little and called her name. Maybe she was hiding from me, but there was literally nowhere to go in the alley except straight forward to the gate, which was locked. There were a couple of access points to the crawl space under our house, but they were covered in wire mesh and required one to slide a bolt back to pry it off its holes. She was gone. She had turned the corner and vanished mid-laugh. A growing sense of dread filling the pit of my stomach, I called her name more profusely. Sensing something was wrong, Sarah roused herself and came over to see what was happening. When I explained, she frowned and made her way down the alley. We searched every inch of the backyard, panic rising in our throats, our chests aching and tears fighting to flood down our faces. Losing your child is possibly one of the worst feelings in the world. Minutes passed. We continued calling her name and searching. I pulled vines back along the neighbor's gate, desperate to see if there was some kind of secret entrance or hole in it. There was none, and the lock on the gate remained firmly in place. I pried one of the mesh screens off the entrance into our crawl space under the house, though there was no possible way she could have pulled it off and gotten under there in the few seconds it took for her to disappear. Turning on my phone light, I ducked into the crawl space. The ceiling hung above me just about a foot over my head, and in my panic I bumped into the various beams that jutted out of the floor. Heedless of the little scrapes and dirt now beginning to accumulate on my body, I belly crawled forward into the dark. 
I called for Fiona frantically. Outside, I could hear Sarah calling as well and start to make her way into the house. I cast my cell phone light around this way and that, and it caught a slight gleam a few feet in front of me. Curious, I crawled forward and unearthed a medium-sized wooden box about the length and width of a tackle box. I was silent now, suddenly fascinated by this ordinary-looking box. It was made of dark brown fading wood, maybe old rosewood and a chipped lacquer coating to it. A small lock hung on it that required a tiny key. I shook the box slightly and felt a gentle yet solid rocking in it. Perplexed, I went to pull on the wooden lid. It was locked tight. I was about to pull harder when my wife's voice brought me out of my stupor. Mike, she yelled, I hear something. Gripping the box, I wriggled my way out of the crawl space and into the light. Filthy, I stood up only to find Sarah silent and straining to listen to something. I approached her and she waved me to shush. I cocked my head to listen as well, and then I heard it. A faint, scratching noise. It was hard to tell where it was coming from. The sound seemed to come from every direction at once. Suddenly we turned our heads and gazed at the barn. The scratching was coming from the upstairs window. We looked up and there she was. Fiona was standing at the window upstairs, slightly scratching the pane of glass with her left index finger. She seemed to be staring far into the distance, heedless of us. To this day, I can still see the image of my daughter up there scratching at that window. Fiona shifted her gaze downward to look at us. She seemed to regard us with cool impassivity, as if detached from reality entirely. For a moment, we looked at her as if we were suspended in time. Seconds seemed to tick by like hours. And all at once, suddenly, we sprang into action. I pulled the keys out of my pocket and frantically began to unlock the barn. That was the thing. The barn was locked tight. There was absolutely no way a two-year-old could have possibly gotten in there on her own. We flung the door open and ran up the rickety stairs, flinging our arms around her, laughing and sobbing all at once. She accepted our hugs, but stood placidly and regarded us with a look of inquisitive detachment. She didn't raise her arms to hug us or respond in any way other than to mildly acquiesce when I scooped her up and brought her into the house. It was then that I realized that I had dropped the box somewhere outside in the tumult. I told myself I would retrieve it later. Fiona was completely physically unharmed after her brief disappearance, though mentally she seemed to have oddly checked out. She sat vacantly in her room, eyes half-lidded. She absently took food from us and told us she was tired with the phrase, I night. We put her in bed and immediately called her doctor, fearing that she may have suffered some form of concussion. Her doctor listened to her symptoms and assured us that we need not visit an emergency room, but gave us an appointment for the following day. We did not mention her bizarre disappearance. The rest of the day found Sarah and I fraught with anxiety over Fiona's well-being. She spent the day hardly saying anything and looking at us in a most curious manner. It was almost as if she regarded us as two interesting insects, and nothing in her behavior suggested that she recognized us at all, except when she took her food or requested to watch something on TV. A few times she pulled out her crayons to draw. She sat in front of her paper and, with a black crayon, scribbled circles over and over until the entire paper was a circular black scribble. She scribbled the circles for what seemed like hours, and by the time she was done, the paper was quite unnerving. It looked like a gaping black tunnel, leading endlessly into itself. In short, terrifying. We debated taking her into the emergency room that day, but ultimately decided it would be better to let her rest at home and go to her doctor the next day. That night, I hardly slept at all. 
I tossed and turned, read my book, and fretted at the ceiling. I was finally beginning to doze off when my eyes rocketed open, my body tense, adrenaline surging as my heart began to pound. I gazed at my phone. 3.10 a.m. At first, I didn't know what I was listening to because the sound felt so incongruous to reality. I thought I could hear what sounded like footsteps on the roof of the house. Slow, creaking steps that seemed to be pacing from the front end of the house. We had a one-story bungalow. It would have been tough to get on the roof without making a bunch of noise with a ladder, and that was after you scaled our fence. Each step sounded like the drop of a large dress shoe in a long hallway, followed by a creaking that seemed to echo through the entire frame. I reached over and grabbed Sarah's hand in the darkness. I flipped on my reading light and she began to protest that I had woken her. I put a finger to my lips and pointed up. When she heard the sound, her eyes widened in shock. There was a five to ten second pause in between each step and the ceiling continued to groan loudly under their apparent weight. The footsteps were making their way methodically towards our bedroom. Frozen by fear, we stared at each other until Sarah snapped us out of it. The baby, come on, we have to get out of the house, grab your phone, Sarah finally whispered to me. Unable to form thoughts of my own, I nodded and began to rise out of bed. We rushed towards Fiona's room, but in the hallway we heard the footsteps pick up their intensity and speed. What was at first a slow, arduous pace became a brisk walk and suddenly a run. I opened my mouth and emitted a muffled cry. Sarah barely had any time to elicit a gasp. Now the pounding steps moved directly over our heads to the edge of the roof. Then there was silence. We stood, frozen in terror, listening. It felt like an eternity of waiting, but it must have been five seconds that we stood, straining to listen. Tears had welled up in Sarah's eyes, and her right hand slightly shook. Without a word, we flung open the door to Fiona's room. To our dismay, she was not in her bed, nor in her room. We gave each other a panicked look and split up. Sarah heading to the living room and myself heading to the kitchen. I stepped down the hallway and placed my hand on the door to the kitchen. I grasped the handle and hesitated for some reason. I took a deep breath and slowly turned the knob. I don't know what I was expecting, but not what I found in there. I let out a cry of disbelief. Every single cabinet was open, and neat stacks of dishes, bowls, and silverware lay in piles on the kitchen floor. The refrigerator was propped open with a kitchen chair. Condiments and vegetables lay on the floor in piles. Fiona stood in the rear of the kitchen, facing away from me, scratching the back door with her left index finger. The only sound was the gentle scrape of her tiny finger against the wood. I must have stood in the kitchen with my mouth agape for a while because I was roused from my stupor by a gentle hand on my back. I started. It was Sarah. She nodded toward the living room. I gazed over her shoulder to see the living room was in much the same state. Chairs were overturned. Books lay in piles on the floor. A vase was placed upside down in the middle of the room, flowers strewn in a circle around it. I had been awake almost the entire night and hadn't heard a single sound come from either room. I scooped up my daughter, though she kept reaching for the back door. On a hunch, I unlocked the back door and slowly opened it. Sarah and I gazed in wonder at the upstairs window in the barn. The light was on. The breaker is off. There's no way. I trailed off. Sarah put her hand on mine and slowly closed the back door. Come on, she said. Let's get the hell out of here. 
We were of one mind, and it didn't take us long to hastily throw some clothes into a few bags. I grabbed Fiona and carried her to the car. On the way there, she looked up at me and said, Daddy, fire. She kept repeating that, Daddy, fire, as I strapped her in her seat. We were all wearing our pajamas. We peeled out of the driveway, and as we drove away, I could see the light in the barn wink out like an eye. It seemed to mock me through the rearview mirror. We strolled into the lobby of a half-decent motel at 3.30 a.m., bleary-eyed. The front desk employee eyed us suspiciously, but seemed to lighten up when she saw our small child asleep in my arms. We got a room. I wasn't exactly sure what we had just experienced, but I didn't want to spend another night in that house. We just needed to sleep. I wish my story ended here, and in my heart of hearts, I believed that it would.